Um, so it's a pleasure to be here today. And uh, uh, what I'm going to do is talk a little bit about uh, the organization I work with called Ushahidi. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, some work that I've done in other uh, areas of Africa engaging youth. Um, we're just talking, <coughs> excuse me, we're just talking uh, uh, slightly before the break about uh, uh, this sort of idea of a growing youth bubble across many, uh, thank you, uh, across many developing uh, countries and um, the, the opportunities but also the risks that that poses. Um, so uh, Stephen talked uh, a bit about the, the growing the growing uh, connectivity that is, is reaching the continent. And, and this uh, graphic that I made back in 2009 sort of illustrates some of that. Uh, now, it's a, sort of all over the place, but uh, I'll just zoom in a bit. Basically, what this illustrates is, is just the, the rapid uh, decrease in costs uh, that has reached the African continent over the past two years. Uh, this is the result of uh, uh, these transatlantic cables uh, which uh, previously had not reached the continent. The way in which the world connects to the internet is through these cables. Uh, there was one to uh, the western side of the continent, uh, and the rest, the entire continent, uh, was using satellite uh, for connectivity. Uh, what that did is it raised costs significantly for people on the ground uh, and made it extremely, uh, made the, the, the barrier to entry extremely high uh, for connectivity. Uh, and that's rapidly dropping. Uh, when I moved to Uganda in 2008, I was paying, uh, I believe, uh, $1,000 a month for 256K connection. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's barely faster than those AOL CDs you used to get in, in the late 90s. Um, the, uh, when I left uh, just a few months ago, that cost had come down significantly to uh, $150 a month for a 512 connection. Still ridiculous by Western standards, but extremely, extremely cost-effective uh, in comparison. Um, so uh, this, I can distribute this later. I can give it to whoever would like to see it. But uh, it, it just sort of goes into detail about the, the actual cost per uh, bit um, to the consumer um, and to the network, which is then passed on to the consumer. Uh, as, these, as these costs come down, uh, we're just starting to see more participation online. We're starting to see this uh, create the infrastructure that's needed for, for communication in lots of different ways. Uh, the company I work with, uh, Ushikiri, makes a platform that allows people to sort of uh, self-report uh, things that they observe during crisis scenarios. Uh, this wouldn't be possible uh, without uh, both the, this rise in mobile uh, connectivity, but also in internet connectivity, and uh, the, the, just having the infrastructure in place to allow this to this self-organization to occur. Uh, and I think the, the opportunity in the self-organization is that communities can help themselves in the absence of government. Um, it also uh, presents a, a number of, of risks uh, where Groups who are self-organizing can self-organize for, you know, uh, positive, uh, beneficial uh, effects. They can also self-organize for a malicious effect, malicious intent. Uh, so before I talk more about that, I'll, I'll sort of give you the history, of, uh, brief history of Ishii and, and Swift River. So uh, in 2008, I started a company called uh, Africa, which um, the goal of Africa is to build uh, local capacity for high technology work. Uh, so you can imagine, uh, uh, so at the time, uh, my sort of model for, for what I was trying to do was uh, Infosys in India. And the way that they uh, engage uh, local talent to solve local technology problems. Uh, in Uganda, uh, when I moved there, uh, there was a, a huge network of very talented youth uh, that weren't quite employable. Um, they had gone to university, they had uh, done sort of everything right, so to speak, in terms of uh, getting their education, uh, growing up, being positive um, uh, examples. Uh, but there was no jobs for them. The local economy didn't support that. Uh, what Africa, uh, uh, what 
like to position Africa as, as a way for multinationals and NGOs coming to the country to work with local talent uh, at local rates as opposed to uh, contractors from wherever they came from who cost significantly more uh, and it's just horribly inefficient to solve problems in that manner. Uh, so the role of Africa was to sort of, um, uh, sort of twofold, save money for NGOs but also uh, build local capacity and local wealth for uh, Uganda, uh, Ugandans. Um, since then, uh, so Africa, that's sort of the role Africa played. It became more of a consultancy, incubator, mentoring group. Uh, as we grew, we uh, separated the, the incubation aspects from the consulting aspects. So doing the work for these organizations and sort of decoupling it from the, the aspects of of mentoring, training, and, and nurturing youth. Uh, and so Hive Collab uh, became the, the sort of incubation arm. Uh, both companies are still in operation, both are still going quite well. Um, the, generally the model is supporting uh, the, the, uh, this side of the company, the, the incubation arm, because it doesn't really generate any income uh, with the consulting work that we do, uh, the consulting work that the local talent does. Uh, sort of this feedback loop of, of uh, innovators supporting future innovators. Uh, so going back to Ushahidi, um, Ushahidi is a platform that allows uh, groups to uh, collect information and visualize it geospatially, as uh, Stephen pointed out. Uh, and you gave a great analogy of, of the radio station. Uh, this is uh, a process that ha has existed for a long time. This. Uh, you know, we have uh, a, a distribution platform uh, that allows people to uh, sort of s send in their reports. Uh, the analogy there would be that uh, in radio you have the, the DJ who has the distribution platform and you have the public who wants to call in and, and report something, who wants to share bits and pieces of information. Uh, what Ushahidi does is it, it takes that idea and puts it on a map uh, puts it on an open source platform that allows uh, participants to uh, share information uh, about what's occurring around them. Uh, and this obviously has many different, um, many different applications. At the top here you see Atlanta Crime Map, which is uh, an adaption of our platform to report crime around the city of Atlanta. Um, that was sort of, sort of a domestic use of our platform, uh, something that uh, I think the city of, of D.C. actually does uh, just uh, with a, using their own technology shares this information. Ushahidi has been used uh, a number of times, um, over 15,000 downloads, uh, probably more closer to 20 now, um, deployed in many different scenarios, Egypt, Haiti, Russia, Australia, the Queensland floods uh, very, uh, a couple of months ago uh, was a very interesting deployment. Um, uh, most recently in Japan, uh, during the uh, earthquakes, uh, this was a tool that was used to uh, sort of collect uh, both reports about uh, damaged infrastructure, but also uh, an offshoot of this was used to report effects or potential effects of radiation uh, reported by the public. So uh, sort of going the other way around, this is what the public sees, and we're offering back this back to journalists, the government, uh, and so on. Um, the thing about Ushahidi is that it's not, uh, it's not uh, us doing this. This is a platform that we've built that's open, that the public then uses to self-organize to uh, perform tasks like this. Um, and this is what I mean by uh, self-organization and, and uh, sort of the public rallying around themselves to support themselves. Uh, and just. Uh, as an organization, we're in a position of creating tools that facilitate that. Um, this is more of a, a techie slide. I'm a software developer. Uh, this is um, uh, explaining Swift River, which, uh, so you can imagine if you're collecting crowdsourced information from the public, you can get massive amounts of data back. Uh, it can be extremely <coughs> overwhelming. Um, Swift River is all about make, uh, adding context to that information on the fly to help make it, make it more manageable uh, to perform other functions with. So it's a uh, uh, curation system, uh, adds multiple layers of context, uh, location, uh, tagging, uh, so taxonomy, um, uh, filtering out duplicates, and, and so on. 
um, Ushahidi crowd map, uh, some of the other tools that Ushahidi as an organization offers all sit on top of this platform um, to sort of essentially structure the unstructured data coming from the public. Um, so uh, I guess we'll talk more about this in the discussion that's, that's forthcoming, but uh, I do think that uh, there's sort of two things at play here. One is sort of uh, this growing idea of like uh, just unspent energy, like the, this massive youth bubble uh, across many different countries. Uh, they do have a lot of energy that can be used for both good and bad, and with tools to self-organize, that can become uh, very... Uh, uh, a huge opportunity or a huge risk for uh, many different things, and uh, we'll talk about some of those specifically upcoming. Thank you.